welcome to a brand new episode of Beyond the Indus. And this episode, we're coming off the back of a massive electoral upset in India, as the ruling BJP lost more than 60 seats and the parliament majority. The United Opposition India Alliance has managed to secure an incredible 235 seats in the Lok Sabha, defying the expectations of most observers, including me, and even most of the exit polls. If you want to understand what exactly went wrong for the BJP this election, we're going to have on someone in the next episode to give us a breakdown of what exactly went wrong for the BJP and what potential implications might this have for Indian politics. But in the meantime, if you want to understand more about the election and the two sides and how the campaign went down to maybe understand a bit more about how this verdict actually happened, I'd encourage you to check out our previous three episodes where we did a pretty detailed breakdown of the two alliances and the campaign. But for this episode, we're going to be stepping a little away from India and into the broader ocean that surrounds it, the Indian Ocean. You see, there's a story from the primordial beginnings of Hindu mythology about the great churning of the ocean, or Samudra Manthan, where the gods and the demons of legend put aside the differences to churn the great milk ocean, the Shir Sagara, that surrounded the Indian subcontinent, in order to extract all the priceless treasures and deadly poisons hidden in its murky depths. And I can't help but think about that story every time I consider the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean. You see, the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean region, the IOR in short, may not get as much press as the Atlantic or the Pacific these days, but the IOR has unparalleled historical and commercial significance. The Indian Ocean trade routes have been the backbone of the global economy since time immemorial, ensuring the exchange of valuable luxury goods like cloth and spices but also things like the bubonic plague, the slave trade and colonialism. Today, the Indian Ocean region is once again a theater of geopolitical intrigue, with everyone from the great powers to small island states scrambling to secure their own interests in the region. And to start off, we're going to talk about maybe one of the smallest and most vulnerable of the island states in the region, the Maldives, and how it's managing to secure its position in this great political churn in the Indian Ocean. Stay tuned. So today we're joined by Daniel Bosley. Daniel is a British journalist who spent almost a decade living and working in the Maldives. His book, uh, Descent into Paradise, a journalist's memoir of the untold Maldives, was released by Pan Macmillan India last September. So we're going to be talking to Daniel about the Maldives. I'm sure you've heard of the recent election, but Maldives itself is such a fascinating country. And even in a region like South Asia, Maldives is a country that we definitely need to look into and understand more of. And hopefully Daniel can help us with that. So Daniel, welcome to Beyond the Indus and thanks so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Great. So, you know, I was telling you before, I I don't know where to start with the Maldives because I think we wanted to dive into more the election and the political parties and its geopolitical role, let's say. But there's so many small facts and tidbits that when I was listening to your talk at the Bangalore Literature Festival that stood out to me because you have Maldives, which is a sort of remote atoll in the Indian Ocean, far away from, you know, your major markets. Somehow it's become this tropical luxury resort paradise but it's also the highest percentage of Muslims in any country in the world and the highest number of ISIS fighters per capita, if I'm not mistaken. Despite the traditional society, it has one of the world's highest divorce rates, a growing drug problem, and they might just be swamped by climate change. So before we get into the election, maybe you could start off with giving us a breakdown of Maldives' tumultuous post-independence history, and then maybe talk about the development of its politics you know, in the pre- and post-dictatorship era. Yeah, it's always it's always hard to know where to start. So I think that's a good place to start. I, I remember we, you were talking about um, seeing my talk at, in, at the Bangalore Literature Festival, and I, I can see people, you know, they, they're sitting in the audience thinking, "Wow, I wasn't expecting some of these things, these subjects that come up." They think it's all going to be about resorts and, and maybe a bit of China versus India. But yeah, the, the Maldives itself. I mean, I guess a bit of background for people. It's um, it's a, an archipelago of. Uh, just under 1,200 islands, just southwest of, uh, of India. Population is just over 500,000 now. Um, it was formerly a British protectorate um, until 1965. And yeah, since that time, uh, there was a sultanate until 1968. And after that, uh, we've had well, three or four presidents. The most famous would have been uh, President Mamun Abdul Gayoom, who, was, uh, who led without opposition from 1978 to 2008. And 2008 was when we got a first, uh, the first multi-party 
uh, democratic elections in the country. So that brought in uh, probably the, I would say, tied for the most famous political uh, character in the country, uh, President Mohammad Nasheed, who became very famous for his uh, climate activism. And he's still he's still famous for that. I think he met he met King Charles uh, maybe last month. Mm-hmm. So he's still he's still very active on that on the scene. But uh, he he was president up until uh, 2012, when unfortunately there was a kind of a resurgence of these um, dictatorial forces, and there was a what what amounted to a coup in 2012. It, it was ruled to have not been a coup, but you know the police and the military were, were revolting, and he was forced into resignation. And then we've had a really that that was when I turned up in the country around 2012, and yeah, it got um, very interesting from that point. Um, we had a we had an election in 2013. Nasheed, Nasheed stood as a candidate in that election. Uh, he didn't win the election. That the election was won by uh, former president Gayum's half brother. Uh, his name is uh, Yamin Abdul Gayum. Yamin Abdul Gayum then basically tried to bring the dictatorship back for the next five years. We had the opposition uh, en masse sort of thrown into jail. All the leaders. We had um, this problem you talked about with them um, Salafi jihadis. Which should actually, that had kind of emerged in the late nineties, um, when when there were more calls for, for pro democracy movements. Um, there was also these these sort of Al Qaeda linked groups already present in the country at that time. So, as you'd seen in other Arab Spring countries, um, when you open up the society for more democratic forces, you know you also get more more certain religious extremists occasionally, and this is what happened in the Maldives. So this this group had already been there. And then it really came to the fore when the politics starts to get a bit messy and things start to break down. This is when these groups start to take control. Normally, that would be through political means, as you've seen in other Arab Spring countries. But um, Islamist parties in the Maldives don't really tend to do very well because because everyone's an Islamist party. Like you said, it's 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 a hundred percent Muslim country. It's it's in the constitution. I think it's the only place in the world where it's it's mandated in the constitution. A citizen of the Maldives has to be. Uh, Sunni Muslim, so yeah, what we saw in in the under President Yamin was these groups start to express themselves, but through through gangs, which is very unusual. You've got the, the gangs that that's kind of emerged in the nineties as as drugs started coming into the country. Again, this was a problem for former President uh, Gayum, but then the gangs and and the Salafi jihadis kind of fused together during this period, and and it became really unpleasant. So I'm sure we'll get on to talking about that a bit more later. But I guess to bring it forward to uh, the next election, 2018, was was when, quite inspirationally, I, I thought people decided they, they didn't want to go back to the dictatorship and they voted in um, the party of, of Mohammed Nasheed. Mohammed Nasheed had been uh, jailed, like everybody else, under, under President um, Yamin Abdul Gayum's tenure. So he couldn't stand. So his proxy stood in for him. This, this man's name was uh, Ibrahim Soli. Ibrahim Soli uh, had an underwhelming five years himself, and uh, yeah, now we've seen this this swing back to uh, President Yamin's um, ally, whose name is uh, Dr. Moise, which I'm sure anybody who's read anything about the Maldives in the last few months will be aware of. So yeah, this is a situation we have, and, and with the parliamentary elections just having uh, taken place uh, last month, now President Moise enjoys um, a super majority in in the in the Marshallese in the Parliament. So yeah, that kind of brings us up to date. Yeah, it's interesting, and and I think we'll get to you know the nature of India and Maldives relationship because I think that also has more depth to it than people think. But particularly, what's interesting about the Maldives is, at least from outside, there's this perception that there's one side that's definitely pro India, and there's one side that's definitely pro China. So maybe talking about the election that just happened with the election of Mohammed Muzu last year, and now his victory in the parliament elections last month. His sort of perceived pro-China, anti-India stance has caused some consternation in India lately. So maybe you could sort of break down the recent elections in terms of who the party is contesting it, what were the campaign issues, and, and what do you think propelled Muizu to success in, in both the elections? Yeah, this is this is one of these where I wonder if you spend too long, especially small island politics, if you don't become a little bit cynical, because I, sometimes I struggle to see the difference between the parties and their the, the political spectrum in a place like the Maldives. I mean, it's interesting because as we've talked about so far, the Maldives is infinitely more complex than people would realize. On the outside, it's the whole thing has been painted now as if one guy is pro-China and one guy is, is pro-India. And I, I think 
that's not the case and it's very unhelpful if you're trying to understand the country to, to look at it that way. But I, I do admit that when it comes to political ideologies in the country, it's it's a very narrow spectrum. People normally campaign on sort of three issues, uh, Dean, which is religion, Gaum, which is sort of nationalism, sovereignty, and, and Taragi, which is, which is development. These are the main things. These are the live wires of Maldivian politics. No, and no one's gonna in a hundred percent Muslim nation. No one's no one's campaigning for freedom of religion. No one's campaigning for for gay rights. Th- these are not things that are talked about. It's essentially these three issues and and pointing the finger at the people who are currently in office and saying well, they're not doing it very well. Uh, corruption is a mas- massive issue as well. So there's always lots of po- finger pointing and, and uh, accusations of corruption. And unfortunately, there's always a campaign to free the last the last guy because the last guy is always in jail. Um, I think really much every Maldivian president who's ever been elected has now been sent to jail, apart from the first one who was beaten to death by a mob, and the second one who that was in uh, fifty three, so not not too close, and then the second one who who just left the country straight after leaving office and didn't come back until he was in he was in the box. So this is not um yeah it's 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 not a good place to be an ex president. Is that the one who fled to Singapore with millions yeah. of dollars? Is- well, I don't know how much he had in his in his in his wallet, but uh, yeah, Ibrahim Nasir, and he came back in just after the presidential elections, the first ones. He he passed away, and then he came back, and they named the airport after him, and he was kind of he was he became a hero again, you know. But he wasn't welcome under under Mahmoud's uh, tenure. Yeah, you asked about the uh, yeah what people were campaigning on. So this is why I find it hard to take it too seriously because the campaign, uh, Louise's campaign, was primarily based on the Indira, India out issue which I know you know you want to talk about but also to to free uh, President Yamin President Yamin was jailed for um, 11 years there was, there was massive uh, industrial scale corruption during his presidency he was he was jailed on on two separate occasions for I think 11 years with five million dollar fines for laundering and embezzlement and the whole campaign was was about freeing Yamin and what what happened is um Literally up until the deadline, in uh, for um, candidates for the election, the part his party was still trying to get the Supreme Court to accept him as a candidate, which was insane. I mean, that was never going to happen. Even they, they pull a lot of interesting tricks constitutionally in the Maldives, but even that was never going to happen. You, you know, a, a guy who's in jail cannot stand for for the presidency. It's interesting because this is the exact same thing that happened in 2018. Uh, Ibu Ibu Soli ended up standing as the MDP's candidate. Uh, because Nasheed couldn't stand. Everybody in the MDP would have preferred Nasheed to stand. You know, he's the most char- was at that time the most popular person in the party, but he couldn't. And then you, you get this strange situation where the, the, you win the election and you've campaigned to free this person, and then you do free this person, and then you've got this really awkward kind of dynamic which we're seeing in the Maldives now. Like Nasheed caused a lot of trouble in the end for, for uh, Soli. They had this huge falling out, and this is essentially in my opinion, what, what caused the MDP to fail so badly at the last election. And we're already seeing that with the, with the current um, the current government. Yamin and, and Louise have fallen out massively because Yamin you know, wanted to be the candidate and feels like he should have been the candidate. And now there's this massive rift with these two guys. But interesting, get, getting back to this idea of the campaign promises that don't really hold much water, Louise and, and his supporters seem to have forgotten entirely about Yamin within months. All they did was campaign about freeing Yamin. And they've forgotten the guy already. He's broken off and formed his own party, which won no seats at the at the parliamentary election. So even his supporters, who seemed very upset, you know, pearl clutching and, and waving banners and saying we must free this individual, couldn't even be bothered to vote for him. Now it doesn't look like he's got his hands on the levers of power. So it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the India Out campaign was, you know, one of the platforms that Moise ran on. That's interesting because. Maldives and India have a really long and important relationship, I think. And, and India has played a pretty vital and, and perhaps somewhat controversial role in the country. So maybe as moving on, could you outline the India-Maldives relationship? And, and what are the factors, do you think, that are behind the sort of India outwave that drove Moise into power? Um, obviously, India-Maldives relationships, I mean, go back as far as you want to think, really. You know, Maldives... Maldivian uh, Divehi civilization has been on those islands for, for 3,000 years and it's these cultural ties have been there for millennia 
And it's not, not something I think that one politician can just kind of eradicate just on a whim. What's happened more recently was, um, I mean, we talked about the, the India's ability to kind of police the region, it come, to come to the aid of the Maldives within a few hours when these Tamil mercenaries uh, invaded the capital in 88. But also more recently, there was um, when I was there, there was a, a crisis, a water crisis, the, the desalination plant in Mali um, set, set on fire and, and there was no fresh water in the capital for days. It was really unpleasant. <laughs> really hard to find somewhere to take a shower. But um, India came over really quick with um, with with the water uh, supplies, and China came soon after. But but it, like it couldn't get there first because that's the reality. India India is closer. The Maldives relies massively on India for uh, education, for uh, medical tourism. You know, Maldives Maldives t- tourism facilities are are moving along. But again, it. it when you're on the islands, if anybody wants to get anything done seriously, they won't feel comfortable having it done in the Maldives. Immediately, they'll book their trip to uh, Trivandrum or Bangalore. They they don't they they want to go there for education and they need to go there for medical care. The Maldives relies on India for uh, imports of like basic foodstuffs, and it normally gets preferential uh, trade terms. Has done for decades. Same with construction supplies. These are just these are really long term economic and cultural ties. This um the India out thing. So I mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's no Obviously, there's no sort of deep-seated animosity. There's, there's going to be a mild kind of inferiority complex, like maybe like you mentioned, with other South Asian nations. Nobody likes being the, the little brother all the time. It's It can be frustrating. But um, recently, what's happened with the India Out campaign, I believe, personally, is, is purely to do with domestic politics in the Maldives in that when, like I said, the, the spectrum is very narrow, so it's very hard to find something to campaign on. And nationalism is, is always, you know, useful for politicians who haven't got great imaginations everywhere. And and what happened in, in the Maldives was um, after Nasheed uh, won the presidency in 2008, one of the first big development projects he, he inaugurated was was to, to upgrade the airport. That project was given to the Indian company uh, GMR, which was upsetting, I think, to a lot of people in the Maldives because a lot of nationalist types, because they, they take a real pride. They don't build a lot of things in the Maldives, you know, it's... It's, it's not the kind of place you need to get outside help for a lot of development projects, but they built that airport themselves in the 60s, and people were extremely proud of it. And, and when we talk about tourism, you know, it, it completely dominates the economy there. The Maldives was a subsistence sort of fishing nation for 2,000 years, and then in the early 70s, the commercial tourism came along, and now it's, it, it's responsible for sort of 90% of government revenue. So this is the main gateway for what's going to be 2 million tourists this year. It was around a million back then, 2010, when this deal was signed. So this is when this campaign began against, initially against the airport development. A lot of people, I remember at the time, it was a lot based, people complaining about the business model, saying it wasn't a good deal. And it was only the anti, the actual sort of um, xenophobic stuff that crept in very slowly. That wasn't initially the reason. But then what what happened under President Yarmin, if we go back to this coup, obviously everyone realized it was a coup in 2012 quite quickly. And then when President Yarmin came in, it was obvious that, you know, he was going to try and roll sort of democratic project back people started getting thrown in jail we had this issue with the jihadis that we talked about and he started getting a lot of criticism from traditional aid partners from india from commonwealth partners and coinciding with this you've got this you know the the economic miracle in in china they're already sending so many tourists to the maldives you know biggest biggest outbound tourist market in the world and so you've got this flood of chinese tourists flood of chinese money and you've got this this guy in the maldives who doesn't want to take any flack from human rights defenders in in from the traditional aid partners, so it made perfect sense that, that he would switch, decide he was going to pivot towards Asia, and, and he made this big announcement: "I'm I'm sick of this. I'm going to pivot to Asia." And all these development projects started coming in from China. You know, China really sort of lent into this as well and, and started taking advantage of it. But sometimes I really feel like if Nasheed had given that airport project to uh, the Beijing Urban Construction Company instead of GMR. This whole thing might be happening in reverse. People might be marching around and chanting uh, China out. But I also think, I do think that um, what you said about places where, where it's easy to dislike the person that you can see, right? And so in Bangladesh or other places, there's strong Indian presence. So if you have got an inferiority complex or that you're going to target people you can see around you, there's, there's no Chinese presence in the Maldives. I think China likes to talk about historical ties, but but I mean, what is it, Admiral, Admiral Sheng maybe was knocking around the area in the sort of 14th century, but really there's no, the belt, the, the maritime Silk Road is, seems to me to be a myth, and there's, there's no there's no trace of, of um, cultural ties between India and uh, between the Maldives and China. There's no 
there's no ethnic Chinese groups, not like in, let's say, Madagascar, you know, where you've got maybe 100,000. And there's quite a sizable Chinese uh, heritage population there. There's nothing like that in the Maldives. There are no, none of these cultural affinities like they have with, with India. So, yeah, I think, I think we'll get onto this. But, yeah, I think the ties with India and Maldives are far stronger in the long term. Right. And I guess coming to China, because China's attempting to gain influence in the Indian Ocean region. And I think it's, uh, at least a perception of its rising influence is, is one source of India's concerns. I mean, not just in the Maldives, but uh, around the Indian Ocean region. You don't need to be culturally aligned with China to receive investments from them, as we saw. Right. The situation yeah. with Gwadar, um, you know, some port investments in Bangladesh, Hanum Patota in, in Sri Lanka. So, you know, how do you, how do you assess the growth in China's role and influence in the Maldives? How seriously should India take this as a broader, let's say, issue or concern in its geopolitical matrix? Yeah, it's interesting the, the the point you make about there not being these ideological affinities because when I was looking into sort of making notes in, in preparation for this podcast, it did occur to me that it's, it's all just about the money. If you just follow the, the dollars and, and follow the rufia and follow the, the yuan, I mean, the, the China needs to make money to, to continue with its um, project, with the party, the, the Communist Party is working on there. The Maldives needs, Maldives now, for example, and Yat, yeah, President Yamin, when when he was taking all this Chinese aid, they need to feed their supporters with with his development project. So the rise of China in the Maldives, I think, is it's portrayed as, as kind of this 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 great game, like like we mentioned earlier, we use that phrase and this really concerted effort. But then I've heard other people when you talk about the Belt and Road Initiative will tell you that most people in China don't really know what that means. It's, it's just kind of a vague concept handed down, and then people lower down sort of have to work out what that means. So in terms of the the, the Chinese influence in the Maldives, they, they seem to have seen an opportunity uh, in 2014 when, when Yamin was looking for new aid partners, and they see an opportunity now because what's been happening recently recently was very interesting that this whole pro-China candidate thing is, um, well, I mean, when Moise himself is asked about this, he says, I'm I'm pro-Maldives. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not entirely sure that. I think that's true. Uh, that That's true to a certain extent. I think he might just be pro his supporters, but I don't. I don't think yet he's particularly got any kind of affinity with, with China in the long term. And you can see now. I mean, if we go back to to after he took office, if we follow the timeline, they've had this huge. Um, he had all these people that that had really got all hyped up about this India out thing, and there was obsession with this um, seventy or eighty or ninety. The figures keep changing. Uh, soldiers who were based in the Maldives. Uh, China, India had given the Maldives an aircraft to help with them um, maritime surveillance and a couple of helicopters. One of them used to live down the road from me where I was living in uh, Adu, down in the south. So I used to go past one of these helicopters quite often. And uh, they needed some the Indian personnel to maintain them and to, and to fly them to help with their search and rescue and things like that. So Mui's got obsessed. They, they decided this India out thing had finally been, been chiseled down to this idea that everything would be fine if they if they just got rid of these 80 Indian soldiers. And what's happened in... So, so this, when he took office, that was the first thing he demanded, like, this has to happen. And instead of going to India on his first state visit, as as he would normally do, he actually went to Turkey to try and sort of see if they could feed the Maldives rather than India feeding the Maldives. So they're trying to set up new arrangements with, with um, Turkey. Also, he's trying to um, set up medical tourism in Thailand and the UAE to, to reduce that dependence on India. But then he, he took a state visit to China in January, came back with, with you know, handfuls of MOUs and he, he begged them to start sending more tourists because um, obviously the, this had dropped off massively well, altogether during the pandemic. But prior to that, China had been the the, mass, the, the biggest um, market for, for tourists to the Maldives for quite a long time. So he came back making this big speech about, oh, nobody's going to bully us, basically aiming that, that comment at India. And so what subsequently happened about three weeks later is India showed, I think, quite clearly that it, it can bully the Maldives if it wants. A, a couple of times, uh, Indian soldiers um, boarded Maldivian uh, fishing boats inside the Maldives economic zone um, with no explanation. I think they said it was some kind of miscommunication, but it was a miscommunication that happened on two separate days. Um, and, and there was absolutely nothing the Maldives could do about it. I think they were sending the message then, you know, it's almost impossible for you to police your own EEZ. So... I think you need to calm down a bit, and and they've reached an agreement now of these this massive problem with the soldiers that um basically uh, they've just they're just going to change the uniform and I think they're just going they're going to be civilian personnel. They say instead of seventy nine soldiers, it's going to be seventy nine civilian personnel. I don't know if they had to go back to Delhi and change their clothes and fly right back for that arrangement to work, but it just seems like a compromise now. Like like I think Moise wants this problem to go away. India has bided its time, so this problem will go away. Um, 
in terms of how China China's long term how how India should approach that, I think I think they've done quite well in not overreacting too much to Mui's um, and his supporters getting getting hysterical. Obviously, I, I know I don't know if you saw this um, boycott campaign in January. Each campaign, the yeah, with Modi walking in the beach. I didn't know what to make of that. I didn't know if that was just a Twitter phenomenon or was that a genuine sort of uh, you know forty chess move by the Indian government or something. I I don't know because I, I really don't know how things work in India, but it seemed like there were a lot of real hardline Modi supporters. But this involved people like Akshay Kumar and uh, Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, so many people got involved with this thing. Uh, and I don't know why the Maldives took exception to Modi walking on the beach in, in Lakshadweep. But yeah, that, that became quite hysterical. And I think India did well. Not I, I thought it was quite well played, to be honest, if, if there was kind of official involvement from India, because you wouldn't know. I mean, or, or, or involvement from Modi himself or his supporters, because that's the way you, right. that's the way you do it. Surely you don't you don't come back and, and get involved yourself like Louise did, making making silly comments. But in terms of yeah, um, I think India would be very concerned. The, the the aim seems to be to get a military base in the Maldives, and every every agreement is always kind of prodded and 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 looked at suspiciously. Like is this is this this military base? There's um the problem with India, I think, during the MDPs, the, the Ibu Solis campaign at Tenure, so 2018 to 2023, was this uh, UTF base so in a place called uh, Uturu Tilafalu. There was it was an agreement that had been signed again under Yamin. So I talk about this idea that there's not a lot of um, I- real ideological affinity here. But Yamin was more than happy to sign deals with India. He was he was doing deals with China, but he was doing deals with India as well, describing India as as one of his closest friends. As as Moise has started doing now, this thing is, has been cleared up with the soldiers. And this this deal for this naval uh, dockyard was signed or was talked about when he went to visit Modi in 2016. So it was only when the NDP signed actually put pen to paper on the deal in 2021 that this hysterical India out campaign just just grabbed hold of this and this became a big issue then. But I think India. India will be looking closely now at projects that China is working on in the Maldives. There is a project in a place called Lamu, Lamu Gadu. Uh, I visited this island. It's a very interesting place. It was de- depopulated by the government about like, seven years ago. I mean, it was it was tragic the way they did it. People had been on this island for, for thousands of years, like I say, and they were given a sort of two months notice, like you need to leave the island. We've got a plan for this island and nobody knew what the plan was. And there was a lot of rumors that it was going to be some kind of Chinese base and then nothing happened. Well, now I'm seeing reports that a deal has been signed to build a transshipment port with the Chinese company. So I think India will be looking very closely at that to see, is this is this the base that we've been worried right. about? Right. And uh, you know, just as we end this interview, and then thank you so much for all the detailed information you've given on a subject that we don't talk enough about, I think. Are there maybe links and sources, maybe in the English language, where we can follow what's going on in the Maldives? The paper that y- you were editing, is that still operational? or No, um, that stopped publishing around uh, 2019. In the Maldives now, there's an, a paper called The Edition, which is like the English language version of the, of the country's major newspaper. I know the editor there, she, she used to work with me at my newspaper, so she's she's very good. So I would probably recommend people go there. So that was fascinating, Daniel. Thanks so much for contributing. And uh, it's a region I'll be following the next few months to see how India is going to be reacting geopolitically. But yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Daniel. Uh, thank you for having me. And that was Daniel Bosley giving us a detailed breakdown of the Maldives election. But the drama at the Maldives is just a small part of the wider geopolitical game being played out in the Indian Ocean region, stretching from the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf in the west to the Straits of Malacca in the east. The Indian Ocean has historically played a vital role in facilitating global trade and is today rapidly emerging as a key theater for strategic security and economic competition in the changing global geopolitical landscape. So to help us understand what's going on, who are the participants, and what's the outlook for the Indian Ocean region, we have returning to Beyond the Indus, friend of the podcast, Dr. Rajeshwari Pillai Rajkopalan. Dr. Rajkopalan is the director of the Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation. Previously, she was the technical advisor to the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts on Prevention of Arms Race in Outer Space and also Assistant Director at the National Security Council Secretariat in New Delhi. She has edited or published nine books on global security, nuclear, and geopolitical topics, and her work has been featured in leading publications like The Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Times of India, and, of course, The Diplomat. 
I could not think of anyone better than uh, Dr. Rajkopala to talk about this detailed issue, given her extensive experience. So, uh, yeah, Raji, it's uh, fantastic to have you back on the podcast. Uh, welcome back to Beyond the Indus. Uh, thank you so much, Tushar, for having me here today. Thank you. Great. So, before we get into the specifics of this topic, maybe you could start by discussing uh, the Indian Ocean region and its history uh, in general. It's always been a significant region for global trade. Maybe you could start by outlining the strategic and, and commercial importance of the Indian Ocean region and its role in the modern global economy. Uh, sure, I think that's a great place to start. I think, uh, like you said, uh, Indian Ocean region has been a significant region historically. Uh, but that region, I think, is witnessing some renewed attention, uh, mainly due to the uh, country and glo- uh, importance of global trade, uh, geopolitical competition, and maritime security, which is becoming more varied and complex. Uh, the fact that IOR, or the Indian Ocean region, accounts for more than one-third of the world's bulk cargo traffic and two-thirds of the world's oil shipments speak to the uh, critical importance of the region. And connecting three different continents of Asia, Africa, and Australia, uh, the IOR has 35 countries and 2.9 billion people. That again, uh, it brings in the enormous in, uh, enormity of this particular region in a sense. But looking at the strategic importance of the region, which has become quite critical over the past few years, uh, Indian Ocean has emerged as a critical strategic arena for all the major naval players because of the many strategic benefits it comes to um, from the use of uh, that particular theater, but also as a way to kind of limit and contain the growing strategic role and influence of China uh, in the Indian Ocean region. All of the traditional Indian Ocean naval players have a direct stake and uh, interest in the region, which has in fact translated to uh, their goal of maintaining a free, open, inclusive, rules-based order that would ensure security, stability, and prosperity to the region. Uh, There are, of course, differences in terms of individual goals, priorities, and capabilities, as well as capacities. But the traditional IOR players are India, US, France, Australia, uh, the UK, and Japan. And all of them have had a long history of engagement uh, economically, militarily, diplomatically, and so on and so forth throughout the Indian Ocean region. But these are beginning to change, and the region is witnessing an increase in strategic competition primarily because of China's fast-growing presence and influence in the region. And given the confrontational nature of ties between China and many of the traditional Indian Ocean maritime powers, the competitive dynamics in IOR is unlikely to disappear anytime soon. Um, And of course, China is not the only emerging player in the Indian Ocean region. There are others as well. Uh, The United Arab Emirates, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Russia. uh, These countries also have their growing interests but I think China's growing capabilities and presence in the IOR appear to be most consequential. Uh, then, of course, the other complicating issues when it comes to the IOR is that it has a number of uh, critical sea lanes with chalk points, such as the Strait of Ormuz, Strait of Malacca, uh, Babel Mandeb, and all of these chalk points are strategically important due to the large volumes of trade that pass through them, as well as the fact that they are some of the critical energy lifelines in a sense. Uh, these sea lanes are challenged by a number of threats, including trafficking, non-traditional threats, piracy, and other conflicts, which have been the case in recent months in particular. But the region is also uh, commercially important because it's, like I said, the IOR is a major trade and energy corridor. Um, and the large bulk uh, cargo traffic, energy shipments, as well as being a trade route, uh, makes it critical to ensure that freedom of navigation and smooth flow of goods and services continued in this particular uh, in this particular theater. But given the great power competition and China's hegemonic vision of the region and beyond, uh, the security dynamics have become much more dominant in recent years. But I think it's nevertheless, it, the effort is to ensure that there is that maritime security is maintained and is able to provide uh, stability to the shipping lanes of communication, uh, the sh- uh, shipping lanes and trade routes so that the region remains somewhat stable and prosperous in a sense. And I think this is a long-term goal for most of the uh, traditional players, as well as at least some of the um, emerging players in the Indian Indian Ocean region. Right, and you mentioned uh, some of the challenges in the security situation, particularly in the Western Indian Ocean region. And we've seen that both in the Babel Mandeb as well as the Straits of Hormuz, 
uh, yeah. the security situation has deteriorated in the uh, fallout of the Israel Gaza crisis. Can you maybe give us an overview of the um, the security situation around these two strategic choke points and and the sort of wider consequences it might have uh, for the world? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. The security uh, situation in the Western uh, Indian Ocean region has worsened a great deal uh, since October now, but last year, uh, mainly as a result of the Israel-Hamas conflict, uh, and in particular, the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, and to put it mildly, the security threats have become quite complex. The Houthi attacks on merchant ships have caused major disruptions in mercantile trade, and this has prompted many major shipping companies to alter shipping routes um, uh, creating a lot more uncertainty in this part of the world and uh, the, on this particular is- issue, in a sense. Um, uh, piracy was seen as somewhat declining for a decade now, but it, I think it is making a return for sure. Uh, these attacks on commercial shipping vessels with aerial drones and rocket propelled grenade strikes uh, from fast moving boards will possibly continue because it is cheap and effective as far as the perpetrators are concerned. Um, and this is, in a sense, giving way to new trends in naval warfare, a form of guerrilla warfare in sea. In all of this, the role of states as, um, states like uh, Iran is absolutely critical. But there are also some of the other more traditional challenges in the region, including uh, illegal, unreported, uh, unregulated uh, fishing, maritime terrorism, and trafficking, and so on and so forth. And managing all of these old as well as new challenges need certain amount of concerted efforts, and many of which have to come from the regional players also. But the absence of effective regional mechanisms to deal with these challenges is also striking in a sense. Back in the late 2000s, there were a couple of uh, handful of institutions that dealt with the Somalian piracy and such other issues. Uh, But these issues, especially the uh, piracy issue, has been seen as fading as a a major threat in the past decade. And therefore, these regional mechanisms have also trimmed their operations and activities and so on and so forth. In fact, two organizations set up by the Indian Ocean Commission, uh, the Regional Maritime Information Fusion Center, RMFIC, uh, FC, and in Madagascar, and the Regional Center for Operational Coordination in Seychelles. Uh, these are the two uh, sort of uh, two organizations that form the uh, executive leg of the maritime security architecture as well as the Western Indian Ocean is concerned. And they have engaged on these particular issues but again, I think there needs to be much more concerted efforts coming from all the major maritime players. And that really has not been coming through. And I think that's something that is worrying that it does not really happen. But uh, we also need to see how some of the other security dynamics, uh, for instance, how uh, some of the other emerging players like China, what kind of role they would play and so on and so forth. So there's a whole lot of uh, competitive dynamics, the U.S. and its uh, uh, partners on the one side and you have countries like Iran on the other side. So how do you manage all of this? And uh, But first and foremost, I think you need more concerted efforts from all of the major maritime players if that has to be un- under control. Right, and a couple of thoughts come to mind as, as you were describing that situation. And one of them is that the Houthi attacks, at least in the Indian Ocean, in some ways resemble sort of a synchronous problem that the Israel-Gaza situation saw, you know, in earlier years yeah. where you had uh, rockets being launched for a fraction of the cost that it takes to actually right. defend exactly. rockets. So that's one interesting exactly. aspect of that. And the other one yeah. is the entry of non-traditional players. I recently saw right. an article about Turkey signing a deal with Somalia. And I've seen this entire changing situation. You have the traditional guardian of the global yeah. uh, seas, the U- United States, repeatedly mm-hmm. expressing its commitment to uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific. And right. they launched Operation Prosperity Guardian in response to the Houthi attacks. Yeah. So could you maybe evaluate the United States and maybe broader Western strategic interests and their role mm-hmm. in the Indian Ocean region? And I guess a big question is, you know, to what extent will the U.S. continue to maintain its traditional role as a guarantor of open seas in this region specifically? Um, yes, uh, the U.S., I think uh, their primary interest in the region uh, would continue to uh, be uh, keeping the sea lanes of communication open and uh, the security of slots for open trade and energy communica- energy transportation remain uh, intact in a sense. Uh, so providing security and stability on these two fronts uh, remain the most uh, on the primary um, sort of interest in a sense from the U.S. side. Uh, obviously, American, Western, and even global prosperity depends a great deal on this. Um, and this should be of concern to China too. But 
I think the US has taken the lead on this. China's focus has been tribally on piracy and not so much on freedom of navigation and open seas and so on and so forth. Um, it's partly a, possibly a function of the capability it makes um, available on the Chinese side, uh, especially including bases that allow you to monitor and secure these uh, sea lanes of communication. Uh, but I think uh, going forward, uh, the American, the U.S. ability to continue uh, continue this kind of a capacity, uh, can to continue this kind of a monitoring as well as ensuring uh, lock protection and so on and so forth, will, uh, will be a problem because the U.S. is also drawn into multiple conflicts in Europe, uh, Ukraine, uh, South China Sea, uh, um, and uh, and so on and so forth. Multiple theaters where the U.S. is possibly being drawn into. And therefore, even for a powerful country such as the U.S., managing all of these different conflicts and their abilities could be stretched and therefore it could be a bit challenging. But uh, like I said earlier, the guerrilla form of warfare in Sini is going to be particularly challenging. How do you come up with an effective strategy to deal with it? I think that's uh, that will continue to remain a problem. But one of the point is it's also unclear who else can step in to provide these kind of services other than the United States. And I think that's a, that's a longer term challenge. Um, MS, uh, other countries, there may be other countries who may uh, talk about, or who may, uh, who may um, sort of issue various statements and so on and so forth. But do they have the capacity? Do they have the really, uh, the military as well as other capability mix in order to engage in these kind of services? Um, uh, that's also a question in a sense. But by and large, I would think the U.S. will continue to be the uh, continue to be the key player because even when you look at it, the Indian Ocean remains an important component of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. And in line with this particular strategy, the U.S. already participates in a number of joint military exercises. So when you talk about the U.S. capabilities being stretched or being drawn into different uh, different sides, it is also participating with the, in a, in military exercises with a number of other countries in order to create that capability mix uh, or in order to augment that capability mix that is available in various theaters of the Indo Indian Ocean region in a sense. And in this regard, um, India remains one of the strongest naval partnerships in the Indian Ocean region uh, and the India and the US engage in a number of uh, different base, uh, joint military exercises, information intelligence sharing. Um, besides bilateral exercises, the two also participate in multilateral uh, military training and exercises. Uh, the U.S., in addition, maintains strong military presence uh, in the region through its uh, base in Vigogashia. Um, so it has its own ways of dealing with these challenges in terms of building up new partnerships, uh, new arrangements, and so on and so forth. And uh, the U.S. also has also emerged as a strong, as a key arms supplier in the region, thus again strengthening the military arm of its partner countries. So their ability to deal with some of these challenges, even if the U.S. is drawn in multiple conflicts and so on and so forth. And according to a report from last year, the U.S. has become the number one supplier for Australia, Bahrain, uh, Djibouti, Indonesia, Iraq, Kenya, Kuwait, and so on and so forth, um, and is among the top suppliers for several other countries. So the U.S. military uh, presence, its uh, military uh, support to a lot of large number of countries in the Indian Ocean region uh, is also striking. And I think those are um, the, those are different ways, a variety of different ways uh, through which the U.S. is trying to kind of uh, uh, strengthen its military uh, capacity in the region in order to deal with the multitude of challenges that are emerging in the Indian Ocean region. Right, and I think this might fall slightly outside the ambit of this discussion, but there are concerns about the United States' continued willingness, or at least the willingness of its population, to deploy its military forces in the aftermath of Afghanistan. Mm. We've seen a lot of pushback on Ukraine, to some extent, in the Israel-Gaza situation on the left wing of the Democratic Party. And on the other hand, you're seeing a lot of U.S. initiatives like AUKUS, for instance, and the Quad that deal with partners in the Indian Ocean region. I mean, yeah. just to what extent do you think that the United States' presence in the Indian Ocean region would remain the same as it is right now or scale up, considering uh, a certain reluctance on behalf of the population? Do you see that continuing as it is, or do you see them ceding more space to trusted allies like India, for example? So there is a certain number of electors that we see, especially the last few months in the is the uh, its involvement, how much to get involved in uh, Ukraine in terms of even providing aid, the support, um, the support for such kind of uh, military aid for Ukraine coming through, or Israel-Hamas uh, conflict and so on and so forth. 
But I think we should also remember that this is an election year, in a sense. The election is just a few months away. So mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of rhetoric that also plays into the domestic um, sort of audience, in a sense. But uh, I'm not saying that the US, it's not the US of the 90s that we see today. There is There, there are certain uh, new realities that every partner country has to adjust to, in a sense. So the US may um, sort of dilute its presence in some ways um, that we have to remain and uh, we have to kind of see how that plays out. But the U.S. is also mindful of the fact that it can actually strengthen other countries, their capabilities, military capabilities overall. That can also, I'm not discounting the, the in fact, the importance of the U.S. is absolutely critical. The importance of the U.S. as a security guarantor, security provider in the wider Indonesian region, in the Indonesian region, as well as the wider Indo-Pacific, I think it's very, very clear, even for countries like India. But at the same time, they are also these countries are also looking at the possibility of a slightly diminished military presence on the part of the U.S. and therefore looking at all possible contingencies and therefore possibly um, Australia, Japan, India working out their own kind of security arrangements in the region. This is not to sort of say that yeah, the U.S. is not important, but at the same time, it is to complement those security arrangements uh, with the U.S. So there are a whole lot of other um, sort of a trilateral, minilateral partnerships that are emerging in the Indo-Pacific, which may not include the U.S., not because the U.S. is not important, but in order to prepare for a contingency where the U.S. may have a limited, um, somewhat limited presence in, in terms of military presence and so on and so forth. So I think the countries are also mindful of the uh, various different compulsions that come into play within the U.S. and therefore preparing for uh, those situations as well. Right. And I think you mentioned the uh, importance of energy security in the Indian Ocean region, considering the amount of oil and gas exports that traverse that region. And I think people don't have a sufficient appreciation for how important it is for China, particularly with two important choke points, the Straits of Malacca and um, the Straits of Hormuz, for its own energy supplies. And consequently, I see China uh, attempting to make inroads in the region, both militarily and commercially. We just talked to a guest about its relations with Maldives. uh, And we also see activity in countries like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh with its String of Pearls initiative, etc. Could you maybe expand on China's growing geostrategic interests in the region and sort of give us an overview of what sort of tools and policies it uses to increase its influence, what sort of initiatives it's taking to improve its influence in the region? Yeah, sure. Um, no, clearly, uh, China is an important uh, important player. Uh, it's uh, one of the important players in terms of economic, security, and other capabilities in a sense. So it's natural that uh, if China continues to increase its power, it will also seek to expand its control uh, beyond its region. And clearly, the Indian Ocean region is important, uh, like you said, because, it, because of its need for energy, trade route, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, uh, both Indian Ocean region as well as the Pacific are going to remain important for China. And as China gets wealthier and as it continues to uh, um, uh, increase its power overall, it will use all its tools available, whether it is through BRI, other other strategies, including strategy, uh, string of pearls, um, and all of those different tools available at its disposal. Uh, but BRA, when you look at it, it has suffered um, some amount of um, sort of, it has had its own setbacks uh, because many countries, other countries have become more suspicious of the BRA projects. Um, and that is uh, that is a show of success in a sense for the West uh, encountering the BRA because many more countries have become reluctant. Uh, I think the if you look at the, uh, even the photos, uh, photos of from the BRA summit meetings from uh, from the first, second, and third, you can see the number of countries who are, which are participating in the number of leaders who are present in those meetings have uh, uh, clearly shrunk over the years in a sense. And I think uh, many more countries are cautious uh, in, in terms of uh, what they are committing to, what they are getting China to do, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think uh, there have been certain amount of setbacks. Uh, it is not, uh, BRA certainly has not gone as per the uh, expectations of China. Uh, trade is definitely a tool that China has been using in order to strengthen its reach and influence. And I think this has always been uh, a concern for other countries in a sense because China, as China continues to uh, increase its economic dependency with vis-a-vis other countries, uh, we talk about usually um, the uh, Southeast Asian region. Southeast Asia has and uh, they need to trade with China. China. Trading is important to keep their economy running in a sense, uh, which 
gives China a certain amount of leverage. And I think the same goes for much of the rest of the world as well, including for bigger countries like India and Australia, uh, where China continues to uh, leverage in a sense. China uses, at least tries to maximize and leverage as much as possible in terms of, you know. But at the same time, I, I, one has to re realize that there are also limits as, uh, as well. Uh, and I think this was seen in the case of Australia um, over the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, when the previous uh, former Prime Minister called for a in, um, sort of an investigation in the origins of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, how China tried to use the trade um, as a leverage um, to limit the possibilities. But uh, so it's clearly showed in the case of China-Australia trade ties, those trade embargoes, trade um, uh, this, that really did not work. But in a smaller country, uh, for many smaller countries, I think that was that was going to have a much larger um, sort of uh, impact and playing to China in favor of China, I would think. Uh, but it clearly, uh, I think China is trying to use BRI trade and so on and so forth. But the other aspect is this competition, strategic competition between China and the U.S. playing out uh, in different regions in the, in the Indian Ocean region, and that automatically gives certain amount of uh, certain amount of opportunities to a number of these countries in the uh, Indian Ocean region uh, because these smaller countries or middle-sized countries, they want to play one against the other in a sense and try to tries to get the best. And in that in, a, in the, that particular process, these countries would want to use China and, you know, sort of a bad get, get. So the circumstances themselves are in some ways playing to China's advantage because they know they have dealt with the U.S. for a very long time. And now in this U.S.-China strategy competition, which the countries want to give China a certain amount of lead so that they can sort of get the be better deal out of China and so on and so forth. So today's strategic conditions are such that it is to, in some in some context at least, it is playing to China's advantage at this point of time. But I think uh, primarily the primary tool that China uses is trade, and of course BRA they have had lim limited success in a sense so far. But trade is their primary kind of uh, sort of a, a tool that they think. They can leverage, they can maximize their benefits and so on and so forth. Right. And as you're speaking right now on the sidelines of the Shangri-La dialogue right yes. now in Singapore, where Chinese officials are giving their vision of their strategic interests in Asia. Yeah. But Rajiv, if, if I might put a counterpoint, in Germany here, where I'm based, I've been having a lot of conversations with policymakers and politicians, as well as people from countries in Africa that have you know, trade ties with China, investment ties in China. And for the latter group, their counter is that when Western powers come to us, you know, we get lectures and we get handouts. Yep. While China comes here, we get bridges and ports. And I suppose a lot of um, European policymakers are wondering, what is their response uh, supposed to be to China's influence? Is it going to take form of sort of a new Marshall Plan for the countries in the Indian Ocean region? Is it going to take the form of sanction threats eventually, as we're seeing right now with Russia? How does one respond to China's initiatives if one is not comfortable, let's say, uh, from a country point of view, with what China is doing uh, in the region? Yeah, that's always a, a tricky, a tricky issue. And I think I've heard again from a number of uh, developing countries as to when China gives something, they don't ask, no questions asked, for instance, there are no conditions, uh, there are no strings attached. Uh, what about the internal issues? That's all for you to deal with. Uh, with our, whether in terms of democracy or human rights, no questions asked at all. And therefore, there's a certain amount of you know, comfort level for these countries to work with China um, and so on and so forth. But again, countering that, it's always going to be um, sort of a, my, uh, and, and a lot more challenging. But I think the uh, one thing that the U.S. is seen to, and I've heard from uh, some of the officials, uh, former officials, is that how you aid and talk to some of these countries at least educate them well in terms of what they are getting into. What are the what are the pitfalls of this particular arrangement for a uh, for a particular project that they are getting into? What does it do in terms of economy? What does it do in terms of the environment? And providing a better understanding of the of the various China proposed uh, projects in these countries, I think that itself has been um, sort of a, an effective counter in because at least these countries are today in a better position to understand what they are really getting into because otherwise China is doing its own feasibility study and telling them, hey, this is the this is all great for you. This is going to provide Colombo is become going to become the Singapore. That's how it was sold. Or Humbertota is going to become the um, Singapore tomorrow. So you're going to earn all the profits that you can think of. 
because China is doing its own feasibility studies and giving them the sort of uh, that is just an example. But uh, that's the kind of thing. So if you are able to provide um, sort of whether it is Myanmar, another country, or Nepal, uh, many of these countries I've heard they are today better po in a better position because they have had a better understanding of what the pitfalls of what these projects are all about in terms of the different consequences, strategic consequences, uh, economic um, sort of uh, or environment consequences and therefore these countries make their own decisions at the end of the day but at least they are better educated, they are better informed of all the different consequences in a sense, all the pros and cons and then they can make a better decision. And therefore you have also seen many of these countries becoming a lot more hesitant and uh, somewhat reluctant to sign on to uh, despite any number of uh, Xi Jinping's visit, these projects have not really come to fruition whether it is in Ma Myanmar and other countries. So I think that itself, because there are, it is not easy to counter China's um, uh, sort of a strategy otherwise. So you have to give these countries uh, you know, their own pros and cons of what they are getting into. And I think that's uh, that's uh, that's possibly a more sustainable option of way of countering um, China's uh, push. Right, and maybe moving on to the other emerging power in the region and zooming into South Asia specifically and its neighborhood, mm -hmm. could you talk about India and, and how India and its neighbors are responding to the strategic challenges in the Indian Ocean region? It's funny because I remember I was reading this article that quite surprised me about India's deployment to the Bab el Mandeb, which consists of something mm -hmm. like 10 warships. I think it's the second largest deployment from an individual country after the US, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And that's very interesting. So maybe you could highlight what are India's ambitions and how are they building capacity in that region, both militarily and diplomatically. So clearly, the uh, more recent deployment has been uh, has been put clearly in the news, and I think that is uh, a great uh, show of strength in a sense. But I think when you and of course this fits well with the uh, historically the role that India wanted to play. India wanted to uh, play a much bigger role in the Indian Ocean region. But by and large, when I look at the, today's approach, I see it as a very defensive approach. Defensive approach in terms of guarding against China's growth, China's presence. So in a sense, it is a response to the fear of China's expansion into the Indian Ocean region. Um, and I think this is reflected, this is manifested in a couple of different ways over the last, uh, uh, last um, close, to a, uh, close to a decade, actually. Uh, and in fact, uh, in 2014, um, there was a broader change that happened with regard to India's Indian Ocean strategy. Uh, I think in 2014, Prime Minister Modi was in uh, Seychelles when he made a speech uh, where he talked about the Indian Ocean uh, as an important theater, it's as its own backyard, uh, strategic backyard. But India also, in that particular speech, talked about some of the important changes that needed to come in India's Indian Ocean approach. Uh, that was that even if India's this is India's own backyard. India has, India recognized Modi in the speech, recognized the limitations in terms of the capabilities and therefore wanting to build, uh, work with other like-minded partners um, uh, in a sense. And that included the US, Australia, Japan and so on and so forth, which are also the quad partners in a sense. So I think that is, and, and of course, so working with like-minded partners, the major, major naval powers is one. Second was to second aspect was to uh, how India would strengthen its partnership with uh, maritime partnership with the island nation countries. So therefore, in the, in keeping with that policy, you have now seen India building closer relationship with uh, Mauritius, Seychelles, Northern Indian Ocean countries, Oman, and whole range of countries, and of course in Southern Asia with Maldives and Sri Lanka being and so engaging in. Capability, um, sort of a capacity uh, building exercises, uh, military joint military exercises with all of these countries. All of this is happening. Malabar country, Malabar exercise that is again and initially started out out of in India, U.S. military exercise, naval exercise, but went on to include Japan from 2015 as a permanent partner, and now it includes Australia also from 2021 onwards. So again, these are all various uh, ways for India to kind of strengthen its partnerships and so on and so forth in order to strengthen its um, sort of uh, its presence, its strategy uh, in the, with regard to the Indian Ocean, but also to keep a limit on how much China is um, sort of is is, uh, is moving into the Indian Ocean region. So one another problem that, that I see is, despite India's ambitions, it has not been able to expand its capabilities in any meaningful fashion. Um, so, and that comes from the inability 
to expand its military budget. Especially the naval budget has been the weakest. That is a serious problem. Um, budget is barely keeping up with the inflation. So in a sense, you have a lot of ambition, tall ambitions, tall goals, but your capability or your ability to exercise all of that ambitions and play and materialize them will always be dependent on your material capability and the naval capability that you uh, build up in a sense. And I think that is that is an area that is being beat. Um, in, if you look at India's submarine inventory, it's been uh, going down. I think we are somewhere down to about 13 operational submarines, uh, of which several of them belong to a category, a vintage category that should have been retired several years ago. And in fact, uh, instead of retiring them, we try and you know extend their life by doing some uh, minor repairs and so on and so forth. Therefore, in the last few years, we also have had uh, accidents in, uh, with, in, in with regard to our submarines. So, submarine inventory, if I go with one uh, parameter, that's uh, we are we. Uh, aircraft carrier, we were, you know, we were one of the leaders, we were ahead, but today China has overtaken. So, in terms of capability development when it comes to maritime um, capabilities, I think we have not been able to expand in any significant fashion. And therefore, much of our Indian attention is going on diplomacy, partnerships, and so on and so forth, rather than expanding its capabilities because of the um, smaller military budget. And the large and the smallest um, uh, sort of proportion of the military budget goes to the Navy, which has been a serious problem. I do have a question, though, regarding India's specific strategy, because we see India at least try to expand commercially um, yeah. in certain areas. For instance, you see, I believe there's investment in the Sitwe port in Myanmar, yeah. in the Rakhine state, uh, as well as Jabar, famously, uh, in Iran. Yeah. I guess my question is, we know that there is a significant material difference in the resources that India and China can muster uh, at this mm. point. China is far, far ahead. And the second thing is I've heard from certain analysts that the Chinese Navy at this point is not as much of a blue water Navy that it can be a major threat mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. the Indian Ocean. To what extent do you think that the naval component of this competition between, let's say, India and China is important at this stage of uh, China's influence operations in the region, as opposed to commercial developments in the sense of ports and commercial ties with countries in the region? What aspect, the military or the commercial one, do you think is more important at this point? I think uh, uh, both are important. Uh, I don't think we India possibly has the uh, luxury to pick and choose in a sense. Both of these mm. uh, commercial activities, it, it can um, get to, uh, yeah, get it, uh, I think that's it can get going. That's a good place to do that. Um, uh, it's, it's a good strategy to say. But the military aspects cannot be ignored because the military aspects, if you continue to ignore, uh, for instance, if you are not able to build up your capabilities, your anti-submarine warfare capabilities, your submarine inventory, or your airfront getting the number of aircraft carriers in place, all of that is going to have, um, uh, it's going to have uh, reper uh, repercussions for India. There are going to be consequences to India's, um, you know, security calculations. So it's not one or the other. It's not going to be that. Um, second, when you since you said Chabar uh, port, I think that's been in the news for we have talked about Chabar ports for the longest time in a sense for several decades. We have been talking about this, uh, but some of this I also see it as political. How much of it is going to materialize, and how much of uh, is going to be practically feasible, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of different factors that come into play. Uh, I'm not entirely clear, but um, but I think there is also a certain amount of politics that play into. Uh, developing some of these uh, projects and so on and so forth. So, I mean, um, I won't put my hey, yeah, put my bet on that. But my thing is that if India has to be able to be, uh, yeah, like you said, yeah, absolutely. China is far ahead in terms of its uh, resources. The it's uh, it has deep pockets, and therefore it can invest in any number of these uh, these projects, um, uh, military, commercial, all of this uh, in uh, simultaneously. And India has to pick and choose. But India has to pick and choose. I, I agree. But my my own sense is that India cannot ignore uh, the military aspect of whatever is happening and what China is doing, because that will come at a serious cost for India, the neighborhood and beyond. Right. And lastly, as as we're coming to the close of this uh, interview, maybe could you give us your outlook on the geostrategic challenges in and around the Indian Ocean region? You know, what might the potential flashpoints and zones of future instability be that uh, you envision in that region? 
Um, sure. I um, I think uh, the first and foremost to me is the intensification of the great power rivalry, uh, the U.S.-China rivalry. But again, it's also U.S. and U.S.'s partners uh, in this part of the world. And, and I think that is going to play out in the IOR in big ways. Uh, we have also seen Russia-China joint exercise in the Pacific. Uh, not just maritime exercises, they have been strategic patrolling in the uh, the Pacific for quite a number of years now, quite a few years now. But And if that were to happen in the Indian Ocean, I think that's a serious development. Um, or even, you know, um, more plausible developments, like, for instance, China's belligerent approach to uh, Taiwan, or uh, issuing warnings to countries like uh, Philippines at these styles, um Shangri-La dialogue just uh, yesterday, or today, in fact. Um, all of these are, you know, clearly signs of things that are waiting to kind of explode in a sense. So if something were to happen in Taiwan, for instance, some sort of, uh, um, the limits are not going to be, the, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the impact of whatever happens in Taiwan is not going to be limited to Taiwan alone. It's going to be felt beyond, in, of course, in Indian Ocean. Um, imagine if China were to impose some sort of a quarantine in Taiwan. How would it impact? What kind of repercussions would be there for the broader region on the uh, in the Indo Pacific, but also into the specific into the Indian Ocean region? Uh, potential flashpoints. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe Malacca Straits, something could go wrong. But I think the uh, possibilities of military accidents are uh, very high. Uh, something like the EP3 spy plane incidents back in May 2001, uh, just as the Bush administration came into office. If something of that kind were to happen on the seas, I think that's going to be, you know, things could unravel in very, many different ways because it's not like there are um, any effective naval CDMs, confidence building measures that China has engaged in uh, with the US uh, or other partners. So in a sense, the fact that we don't have any CBMs, any uh, naval incidents, agreements and kind of things, uh, uh, those are serious issues to me. So the potential for accidents are very, very real. Uh, maybe uh, Malacca Straits has, have, have, has always been talked about as a potential flash point in terms of a blockade and kind of thing. I don't see that as happening um, in, I, I, I think it's going to be a lot more difficult. But the potential for military accidents um, are going to be far greater uh, because uh, there are no effective CBMs, there are no you know hotlines uh, that are effectively um, are working between um, China and other countries in the Indian Ocean region. I think those are serious issues for me. Right. And maybe you could talk about what trends in the region the global community should watch out for. And speaking of major players and their influence operations, we've talked about the United States, we've talked about China and India. I'm very interested in uh, the role of other emerging powers, let's say, uh, in the region. Let's say Iran, for instance, perhaps uh, the states in East Africa, uh, particularly after the rerouting of a lot of global trade through um, the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. But could you just talk about, one, what, what trends in the region we should look out for and what might the role of these secondary powers in the region be? Um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, the, all the key maritime powers have to work together, but I think that's easier said than done because even though we, uh, like for instance, India, US, uh, Japan, Australia, France, all of these countries need to come together, UK, other countries need to come together, work and work in a sort of with a, um, with a common goal and so on and so forth. But we also have different priorities, different um, sort of uh, a slight divergences, even if it is all about China and limiting, in some sense, China's uh, strength, strength and presence and so on and so forth in the Indian Ocean because of China's hegemonic um, designs, in a sense. Uh, it's a belligerent behavior. Therefore, we need to kind of limit. Uh, even if so, even if all these countries have a similar and a, or a common shared goal vis-a-vis China, there are divergences in terms of individual perspectives, approaches, outlooks. So even when you talk about closer coordination uh, between, you know, closer partners, like closer strategic partners, like-minded partners, I think it has been uh, challenging. But I think strengthening those, so, uh, you know, you can't give up. Then that's not an option. So in a sense, uh, India, for instance, uh, India, US, and other countries have to take the lead, work with, maybe you create a web of multilateral partnerships, maybe not one overarching um, uh, okay, uh, sort of a security umbrella uh, is going to come about very soon. So work with a number of different multilateral partners uh, in order to create those kind of shared security interests and shared perceptions of the 
threats and challenges. I think that's going to be, and that is going to be lim- not to be limited to some of the major players alone, but also involve all the IOR um, countries in terms of um, the second run countries or the island nations. Island nations need to be engaged also, not so much from a purely security and strategic perspective, because for the island countries, their priorities are completely different. For them, environmental challenges, the climate uh, climate change induced challenges, those are the priority areas. So if you go to them and say, you know, there is going to be a strategic competition, there is already a competition, so we need to uh, we need to work our, we need to work together in limiting China. That is not going to really cut up ice in a sense. So in a sense, how do you uh, how do you reach out to these countries? and understand the island countries from their own perspective and work with them so that you create a web of partnerships and all may not have a direct and strategic um, sort of a um, driver that is fine but even if you create that kind of a strong partnership with those countries based on their own requirements which are going to be non-strategic non-security in nature i think mean, that's a, that's a, so it's a good place to uh, have those kind of conversations and i think creating those web of partnerships uh, is the kind of way to go about because it's not going to be Given the kind of divergences and kind of differences we may have with regard to our own individual uh, strategies, we need to uh, have more conversations, more um, sort of, uh, maybe even engage in sort of uh, various simulation exercises and so on and so forth. It does give you a perspective of how different countries approach these issues. I'm not saying that it does. It 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 makes the understanding a bit easier to see if there is a particular scenario that's going to play out. How will different countries, each of the countries in the region, will how they how they respond? Um, so I think these may be some of the ways to kind of go about unilateral partnerships, also um, engaging in some sort of the simulation exercise of various contingencies um, and to understand how each of the countries can play a role, what kind of a role would they play, and I think that can also bring out as to how much the U.S. is going to be um, sort of involved in in a particular scenario in in a particular contingency. What is likely to be the U.S. role? If the U.S. is not going to play a major role, who are those other countries? Which are those other countries that need to step up their presence, their actions in terms of dealing with a particular contingency? I think these are uh, important and essential ways to understand better the kind of um, dynamics that play in the region. Because the Indian Ocean is not just, uh, we see the play, uh, we see not just the great power competition, but there are a whole range of other um, dynamics coming into play. So we need to start thinking about each of these various um, uh, scenarios, contingencies, and how that, that might play out and what role other countries will play in. Fantastic, Raji. Thank you so much for those great insights. I think Thank you. you're right about the fact that it's not just about a security perspective on many of the participants and players in the region, yeah. but also cooperating with them on their priorities. Uh, which I think sometimes gets missed in the broader, you know, strategic dialogue. But right. Ansvaji, thank you so much for those insights. And thank you. yes, it's a good theater to keep an eye on in the uh, coming uh, years. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. And that's all we have time for, for this episode of Beyond the Indus. I'd like to thank both our guests for their incredible insights. I found it quite interesting and I hope you guys did too. We'll be back with a brand new episode next month, hopefully straying somewhat away from the topic of elections as we have been since the start of this year. But until then, stay safe, take care, and bye.